Hey everyone, Ben Eater here. It's a new year, and I find the new year is always a good time for reflection. And you know, because this episode of the podcast is a very similar sort of format to our very first episode, you know, I've been reflecting on how the podcast has gone so far. And uh, you know, high level, I'd say it's certainly been a lot of fun to make, at least at least for me, since you know I really enjoy chatting with Grant and Ben. And hopefully, it's been fun and, and interesting for for you too to, to listen to. You know, on the one hand, it feels like we just started the podcast yesterday. It really doesn't feel like we're already done 12 episodes. And it also doesn't feel like it ought to be time to do another Q&A episode, which is what this episode is. You know, we're going to answer a bunch of questions that were submitted by you, our listeners. Uh, and, and so in a way, it, it is a bit of a return to where we started in that very first episode of the podcast. But what's really remarkable is the reason we're doing another Q&A. You know, Grant's YouTube channel, 3 Blue One Brown, has really been uh, blowing up recently. You know, a couple of weeks ago, he crossed the 500,000 subscriber mark. It's half a million subscribers, which is huge, right? And at the time, I, I congratulated him on the big milestone. And, you know, he said thanks, but he kind of deflected the congratulations and said, you know, no, really waiting for the real milestone, which is 524,288 subscribers. And of course, he's right. You know, half a million subscribers, it's a completely arbitrary milestone that, you know, only makes sense if you happen to be representing numbers in base 10. And of course, most humans happen to have 10 fingers, so we all seem to like base 10. But but 524,288 is a much more fundamental milestone. You know, it represents starting out with a single subscriber and doubling that to two subscribers then doubling again to four subscribers, eight, 16, 32, and so on. And eventually, you know, after doubling 18 times, Grant had 262,144 subscribers and did a, you know, used that milestone to, to sort of do that first Q&A, which was the very first episode of this podcast. And so here we are, 22 weeks later, it's doubled again to this 524,288. And so Grant put out a call for more questions, and today we've got more answers. You know, we tried to keep a pretty tight clock on each question so we could get as many as possible, but we definitely got distracted and didn't didn't get to as many as we would have liked. So Grant answered even more of them in the Reddit thread, you know, particularly some of the ones that were more specific to him. So you can find a link to that in the description somewhere. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's dive in. In light of a recent subscriber milestone, I went ahead and asked people to submit questions to do kind of a Q&A with 3 Blue, 1 Brown. But the hope is actually that this is not just questions towards me. I think I said this in the very first one, right? It's a little bit awkward to have a podcast that's three of us getting together to chat with questions all entirely targeted at me. I was hoping, Eater, that we would have done a Q&A with Ben Eater by now. We'll get there. Can you just, just update me on the milestone? Oh, okay. So uh, 2 to the 19th, which is like 524,000... 288. And this last week has been freaking insane. It just blew yeah, through that. You're almost to two to the 20th. We, <laughs> we need to move faster with this one. Like it was just because it was, it was like a Friday that it crossed over 500,000. It was like, oh, that's nice. And then a couple days later that it sort of got up to that milestone. So I'm like, oh boy, got to put out something for Q&A. And by the time I, I put out the video that was with Eater kind of announcing, hey, I'll do this Q&A thing. It was like another 20,000 there. And then now, I don't know, it's just been... So something something clicked inside the YouTube algorithm where it just decided to recommend the crap out of a certain video. So I'm thankful for that. Is that how you explain it? YouTube algorithm this? So there, well, there are a couple different factors. So this last week, it's conflated with a couple other good things that happened. One, Destin of Smarter Every Day was kind enough to sort of let me contribute to one of his videos. And he, for those who don't know, is like dramatically more popular than I am. So that obviously introduced more people to the channel. There was also a CGP Grey video that it didn't like explicitly mention me, but people sort of talked about a machine learning video that I did in the comments. And also he added in the description because he had actually reached out to me a little before to let me look over the script as if I was an expert on machine learning, which I'm not. I mean, I, I know enough to feel comfortable making a, a couple of videos about it, but I feel like I was at least able to be helpful to give a vote of confidence on certain things there. That was another avenue by which some people ended up getting point, pointed towards the channel. Also, there was like a project for awesome live stream that, again, like maybe not a ton. So a bunch of other little things that kind of trickled in that happened to happen around the same time of year. But the main one, when you dig into the YouTube analytics, it's just most views come because YouTube chooses to put the video in that little suggested videos bar on the right side mm -hmm. or on your homepage. And... In this case, it was just a recent video that I put out that had a kind of clickbaity title 
just fell into the good graces of the algorithm just that decides to put videos there. And I think, and you can actually see percentage of people watching who are subscribers versus non-subscribers. And that percentage started shifting heavily towards non-subscribers like as the week went on. Yeah, I've got one video that, that comes and goes from, from the, as you say, the good graces of the YouTube algorithm. And it's, it, it drives a ton of people to, to my channel. And it's, in my opinion, not that great a video. What, which video? It's this video I did that... Um, I think the title of the video is like comparing uh, machine language and C mm. or something like that. And, and basically it was, it was just kind of like a little context setting thing where I took, you know, this program that I wrote in C that just computes Fibonacci numbers and then uh, disassembled it and, and just kind of walked through the, you know, the x86 assembler for that same program. Just kind of see like, here's what, you know, a modern computer with an Intel processor, you know, makes of this program. Um, and, and the intent was then to compare that to the spreadboard computer that I built. Mm -hmm. And so I, to me, it like didn't really make sense on its own. It was just sort of like, here's a thing that just kind of helps you connect this breadboard computer, the project that doesn't, you know, maybe look like a computer you're familiar with to, to a real computer. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but on its own, for some reason, that one's really popular. Call YouTube up. Ben Eater here. I think your algorithm has gone a little awry. This isn't a great video, but you seem to think it is. <laughs> yeah, I've got better video. Like, <laughs> like I can recommend some. <laughs> recommend the recommender. Do you think it's, I mean, the, the title seem, makes it appeal to people who are generally studying CS at all. And I mean, everyone kind of goes through that point where they're trying to understand the relation between C and assembly. Do you think it's that, or do you get any indication from comments? I, th I mean, I think that is it. And I think, I think this is just an indication that my intuition about what's good, it might be a little bit off because I actually did um, run into someone who found me through that video and really enjoyed the video. Hmm. And I was like, what, what, you know, why did you click on it? He's like, well, I, you know, I've learned a lot about CS and just sort of interested in the, lo the lower level. I never knew how it worked. And that really explained it well. I was like, oh, okay. You just never know. You never, you, you know what, a, know. A, like another super weird thing. So we're all friends with Cam and a couple of people who watch the channel will also know who Cam is because there is an out of ordinary video that involves him getting a tattoo filmed while a pie creature is watching him on the left side of the screen. That's Cam. I thought that was Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Common misconception. Uh, that for the most part was just this super low viewed video that the algorithm was like, what trash is this? No one wants to watch this very clearly. And then again, in the last week, it just, it's just like it had a change of heart and said, hmm, what if I just try showing this to everyone? And very hard to answer why, because nothing, nothing I have a changed. hypothesis. Oh yeah? What is it? Well, you were, you were recently in a video on my channel. Okay. And it garnered a number of, of comments of a particular sort. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> There, there were there were some comments about Grant, let's say, um, complimenting his appearance. So it doesn't strike me as completely strange that a video on Grant's channel of a shirtless man, can't tell exactly who it is, <laughs> might, might attract more interest than usual. <laughs> Just the, the raw It's a hypothesis. I don't, I don't have any evidence confirming it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it's actually pretty, I like, I would buy, I would bet on the hypothesis. Oh man, that was super weird. Because uh, 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 I'm going to go ahead and let this transition to one one of the questions that was in the Q and A. Because that Q and A video, I guess, like most people don't really know what I look like, and had built in their minds an image of me being some old, balding or bald, gray haired, but the nerdy kind of gray haired, not the wise kind of gray haired, like fifty year old man. I don't know why. Maybe I just speak with more authority than I ought to on certain things. So then the expectations were just rock bottom for any notion of, I don't know, what I might look like. And as a result, in this really interesting discussion with Eater, where the central focus is on all these nuances of net neutrality, you just have this, this trashed comment section of people commenting on like me being way younger than they anticipated. So to answer one of the questions of just like, how old am I, since people seem to have estimated twice as high. I am 25. So, so t do with that what you will. Can I, can I ask a question actually about that? Sure. So, Eater, so where were you guys when you filmed that? Eater's house. And Eater, did Grant play with the lighting a lot beforehand or decide in a particular place to sit? 
He was super particular about just getting a certain side and getting the lighting just right. And <laughs> I was, I, I was I good. I was going to say, why he was so Grant, don't it. get me wrong. You have a fantastic jawline. And I've noticed it a couple of times in real life. Your jawline with that lighting in the, with the shadow on it and the positioning of you kind of like a little bit to the side is just noticeable. It's exemplar. I'm going to just switch the topic of conversation hard here because this is very weird. The, okay. Okay. Let me, let me just, let me, <laughs> let me, before switching, Defend say yourself. one final thing, which is everyone should know and recognize Ben Eater is an unusually beautiful man. And yet the, like the, the sentiment here of like all of these comments about just one half of the screen because of the rock bottom expectations, I'm like this feels, this feels wrong. And the one thing that I would like from anybody listening to this right now is to go find that net neutrality video with Ben Eater on Ben Eater's channel and just write a whole bunch of comments, as many as you can, and upvote all of the other ones to this effect, just talking about Eater himself as this, as this ageless Adana. Adonis? Adonis? Is that the word I'm going for? Yeah. And uh, that's my one request, just so that we can... We can have a symmetry of super weird vibes. My one request is to edit all of this out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, see, so let's see, move see, on to these questions. Empathy lesson, right? As soon as I, I talk in one little moment there, I can't see you right now, but I can assume that the face is super red. So, so have a little sense of that. Anyway, let's, after well, like six minutes of meandering discussion, actually get to one of the questions that people asked and the reason people might be listening to this. I don't know. I think they're, I think they're enjoying themselves so far. <laughs> well, I, I am. Um, all right. I've got one. Can I ask it? Shoot. Shoot. Do you believe that there are people who are just not cut out for mathematics or is it a problem of delivering the subject in an effective way towards them? Man. So this is an interesting question because I feel like all of us probably have the knee jerk reaction that the answer is no, that like people start from similar slates and it's just a matter of nurture, not nature. There's not some math gene that individuals have that others don't have. And that's what accounts for them being faster. Instead, it's something about early experience. It's something about mindset. It's about getting into that positive feedback loop. But what I'm kind of curious to hear from you guys is, is there any, is there a component of it that might be a little bit more innate or are there other explanatory factors in that direction. And what one image that comes to mind, uh, do you, do you guys know the mathematician Terry Tao? I do not. All right. So he, um, I recognize the name, but I, yeah, he, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about like a world's best mathematician or something like that. Cause it depends on the field and all of that, but he is widely recognized as one of the best and unusually smart and unusually broad in his, um, understanding of math, right? It's not just one field that he's an expert in. He really knows his stuff in a very large variety. Um, now he, he, if ever there was a prodigy, was a prodigy, right? He is winning this international math Olympiad or kind of getting the highest thing that you can get when he's 11, whereas most, most people in that are, you know, in their high teens. Um, and there's this anecdote that his parents evidently would tell about how when he was two, he was kind of teaching multiplication to his four-year-old cousin. And at that point, you say, what, what two-year-old has any conception of multiplication or math patterns like that? And can it possibly be the case that in those first two years of his life, there was some unusually special experience that he had that led him there? Like, surely this man has some notion of an innate gift, even though I really, like, it really goes against how I like to think about these things to even reference an innate gift. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I mean, I'm, I am attracted to the sort of problem of delivering the subject in an effective way. Um, cause I think there, there might be some amount of, well, I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but, but some combination of nature or nurture leaves you in a state such that you may be more or less, uh, inclined. But I think there might be other, other ways of, of kind of getting at math or delivering the subject, I guess that might be more effective for different people. And I think I'm drawing kind of from my own experience here where, you know, the, the traditional school way of delivering math was not particularly effective for me, you know, but kind of playing on my own and, you know, particularly, you know, solving problems through, through programming and things like that, that kind of led me to explore different areas of math. Um, I found that to be interesting. Do you think the fact that that was interesting to you, that could have applied to anyone? Or was there something a little bit peculiar to you that primed you to being 
interested in that way, provoked by those types of questions? I don't know. I do tend to think that it is it is somewhat peculiar, not maybe not peculiar to me, but but might not be the same in everyone, I guess. You know, for me, I find a lot of interest in in being able to find a very practical application for something. Mm-hmm. You know, pure mathematicians are are the exact opposite of that. <laughs> you know, it's all about abstracting it, and there's no practical value at all necessarily. Um, it's just sort of the interesting pursuit of the problem or whatever. That does not hold my interest at all. Um, if I if I can't get a foothold of some real world problem I'm trying to solve, you know, I, I am just not interested in <laughs> in putting any effort into solving it um, into, until I have some reason. Dunhug, what, what what's your take here? Are there people not cut out for it? I... This question is such a rabbit hole. I don't know, probably a little bit. I'm not sure it's particularly worthwhile to focus on. I think most of our differences that we see between like males and females happen from the way that we we treat them. I think it's particularly it's just not interesting to focus on the genetic difference. I think that's why everyone loves Joe Bowler's research so mm. much and the and Carol Dweck's research so much, the growth mindset, the mathematical mindset. Because that's what teachers like, that's an awesome thing. Like let's focus on what we can do differently to make students believe believe in themselves and have that be a self-fulfilling prophecy and and, yeah, and do do the best with what you've got because if you know can't change what you can't change. Yeah, like it's not interesting. I don't know. It's just not. It's not worthwhile to have this. I hear this debate all the time with genetic variances across racial groups and intelligence and whatever. And I think that's why Joe Bowler is so so awesome. Um, is because she makes that point. There's an interesting. I was just googling it because it's relevant. But Joe Bowler kind of got in the academic disagreement with with Milgram and Bishop where they go back and forth on kind of the validity of her research and questions around this and they get kind of heated and they get kind of personal you can read about it online uh and they they talk about that but i i think the focus on learning and growth is is really cool the learning styles thing really interests me because you you're kind of saying that eater which is you learned in a particular way and that hits you and there's interesting research around that too that typically i think finds that students aren't visual or Spatial yeah, the, the learning particular. styles, yeah, it's like visual learners, spatial learners, auditory learners. That, uh, as far as I understand, is has basically been debunked. Those differences don't exist. And um, so what I'm trying to understand is, so that's debunked and we take that. How, level right. that with what you said of you found some particular curriculum or some particular way of learning to be more effective for yourself. Yeah, for me, I honestly think it comes down to motivation for me. Mm. Um, if I'm not motivated to learn something, if I don't see the immediate value... I'm just not going to, I know myself well enough. I, I know I can't force myself to learn it if I don't see there, there's some value in this. Do you think you would have become more interested in that if way early on you happened to be getting high scores on the tests given to you, or you were succeeding at the elementary school tasks put in front of you, and you had this positive feedback that made you identify as someone who was good at this, and because you were good at it, you liked it, and because you liked it, you were good at it and got into that. Do you see it as a conceivable alternate history for Ben Eater that that could have happened? Or is there something deeper seated within you where just no matter what, it never would have been the abstract problem for problem's sake that got you into it. It was always going to be something else. It's a good question. I mean, I, I could go both ways on that. Like I definitely have these memories in sort of early life of, you know, tinkering and building things. And that was always really interesting, you know, therefore, you know, it gave, it provided this positive feedback yeah, maybe if someone had put math puzzles in front of me at an early age and given me a lot of, you know, positive reinforcement, you know, that would have created a positive feedback loop and and it would have taken me down that path. So I find that fascinating. So you're saying at the same time that learning styles are not a real thing. So if you take the kids that say that they learn visually and you take the kids that say that they learn some other way and you assign them to the way in which they say they learn, they're not going to do any better than had you randomly assign them. You're saying, yes, that can be true. But there might be a different thing where people have like motivational styles and they differ on the degree to which they care about how it's being motivated. And by targeting that and fitting the puzzle with someone's motivational style, they'll act in a different way that will lead to different learning outcomes, but not because the learning style is different in that you learn better from something visual or uh, something like that. I think so. Is that a fair summary? I think it ties to what is your identity, right? What are the things you identify as liking? That can be influenced very early on and become ossified in a certain way within people's way of viewing themselves. So things like abstract math or being good at puzzles, I view that not as a learning style, but an identity that people have. It's not innate, right? Like people can shift their identities, but 
boy, do we know that that takes a lot in order for anyone to legitimately uh, shift how they view themselves. Should we move on to another question? Let me, can I ask one question that parallels this <laughs> just to it, humor the, the question? <laughs> we're, running, we're running long on our shot clock here. I was like, all right, I'm going to have a like five minute shot clock on each question, but prevent rabbit holes, but. Well, hey, call well, this a different restart. question. Restart the shot. <laughs> Another clock. half hour. Um, yeah, but let's is, do a two-minute shot This is how we go into one. rabbit holes for the entire thing. <laughs> the, do you guys think... So on the nature on the nature-nurture thing of math, how do you think it compares on, say, the nature-nurture balance of basketball? Oh, that's a or, crazy or a sport question. like that? I think it's... I think it's entirely analogous. I'm saying this based on nothing. I'm just giving you what my raw, like, intuitive feel is. I think... If you, when you're young, play with a ball and you have a sense for how its weight shifts around and understanding like how the wind might influence as you throw it, or just most importantly, like uh, how it feels to throw it well and how it feels to catch it. I think there's one-to-one -one analogs with playing with puzzles and patterns and doing math where not every kid is doing it in the same way that not everyone kid, every kid is throwing around a ball with his dad. But when you do, it just makes it feel good to do math and good to solve puzzles in the same way that it feels good for some people to play basketball, but it feels awkward and stilted and painful for others. I view this as 100% analogous. See, now I'm starting to wonder because I'm looking back at kind of my, my childhood and I, I remember when I was very young, you know, my parents, I don't know, they were trying to do all the things they're supposed to do as a parent and expose me to different things. And so they, you know, took me to some swim thing where I was supposed to swim and I hated it. And so then the next year they put me in some soccer league and I hated it. And then the next year they took me to some science camp and I was like, yes, <laughs> this is what I want. And that was like, you know, first or second grade. So you're saying pretty early on, there was something predestined about your aversion to swimming and to soccer. Yeah. There was something that, yeah, that the, like the science program was, you know, at least at like second or third grade time frame, you know, I, I clearly had a preference for the science program versus the, the swimming or the soccer. No, I was going to bring up something else, but I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be strict on the right. stop on the shot shot clock here. So, well, the shot clock's a great term. Now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank really? you. You have made this an apropos verb in a way that it was otherwise just a random thing to bring in. Uh, one question on here that I'm going to go ahead and target at Stan Haug first. Uh, so there's someone who uh, had listened to, I think it was the fourth episode we did, where you were talking about playing this improv game with your grandma. And he brought up a couple of other improv games. And uh, he mentions uh, playing them, as suggested, uh, with a couple of his friends and loving it. And he is asking, are there any similar games that you might recommend? If you want to play them live, I'm down with that. Uh, but even just kind of introducing what the games are, I think... I think people will benefit from just knowing what exists. So I, I can run through this. I took, I told you, and maybe the, maybe I mentioned it in the podcast too, but I took the mm -hmm. five-day class with Dan Klein. And you, you're you probably familiar with these games too, but I've got notes on all of the different games. Uh, pick pick, pick your favorites because I, I think I can, there are a couple classic improv games that are lackluster and a couple that are just gold. Oh, there's so many. Um, I'll say here's my favorite, I think. You have two people speaking gibberish to each other. And then you have a translator in between who's actually after each person speaks, they stop and say something in English. And then the other person responds in gibberish and the translators <laughs> has to make a story, but it has to also make sense with the tone of the gibberish and the non -verbal. That one's fantastic. Speakers. Horrible to demonstrate on, on podcast because the key to that, right, is you'll have two people who are up on stage doing some kind of scene, right? They're actually playing out a story. Their physiology and where they're pointing and moving is kind of what influences how people translate their gibberish. So you get this really fun dynamic where a person and their translator are kind of toying with each other, right? Like the person might do some sort of weird motion and dance and have a very clear or apparently clear object in their hands that they're handing to the other person. And they're challenging their translator to describe exactly what it yeah. is. And then on the flip side, you know, you can have the translator be like, boy, I don't know, on the crass side, it's like, my crotch really itches, or whatever it might be. You just have this control over the actor in front of you based on how you translate what they say, and they have to justify it. The, we did a whole day on gibberish. Then we went to Bats, the Bay mm -hmm. Area theater for, that does improv, and they were doing a scene where some a woman was running away from a vampire in Italy. They said, quick, we need a gondola driver. And the woman <laughs> grabs my hand and pulls me on stage. 
And she says, you're my gondola driver. And she goes, all right, pretend like you're driving the gondola. And I was like a little confused <laughs> if we were talking skiing or if I was in Italy and like rowing a boat. So that, that I, I went with the rowing the boat, which I think was right. And then she's like, Sp- speak, speak, um, speak Italian with me. Um, speak it. And I was, I just remembered back to the day. I was like, oh man, if you get lost in improv, you don't stop and say what, or I don't know. I don't know how to say that. You just channel your inner gibberish and you just... You just go. So I'm just standing in the front of the theater, just speaking. It it couldn't sound like anything less. Gobble, goo, pop, pop, boo, pop, gop, pop, pop. Just like one <laughs> syllable at a time. Driving the gondola. So shout out to gibberish. I have I have two particular favorite games that I'd want to mention. But I kind of want to say one thing about improv in general. Yep. I feel like what a lot of people think when they go to an improv show or if they start to do something is that the goal of it is to be funny. I think it's a lot more fun for both parties if you think of it like the goal is to fool people into thinking what you did is scripted, like the measure of success should be if you have three different troops and they go up and do three little miniature shows, imagine telling the audience beforehand, two of these shows are improvised and one of them was uh, written by a famous playwright and it's just a lesser known play. The metric of success for which of those three troops wins is who did people think was doing the scripted show? Because in that case, rather than worrying about like, oh, is this the most clever thing I can say? What matters most is kind of making it seem natural. That suddenly applies to a lot of life in sort of neat ways. Classic warm-up game. You guys know three things? I'm not familiar, but I'm excited. You, wait, you, you, did a, you did a whole improv thing and he never taught you guys three things? All right, all right, <laughs> okay. I might not know the name. So, I might not know the name. Let's hear it. <laughs> I know very little about improv and I know this one. So I'm, okay, well, so I don't know. The, the goal, <laughs> put me the in goal my is place. just be fast and reasonable, right? It's not come up with the best things. And you basically go in a circle. So I'm going to give you a category, Stenhaug. Three things that you want to get for Christmas. You just list three things as fast as you can. They should be reasonable, but the goal is not cleverness. If it's super obvious, all the better. So three things you want for Christmas. A lot of cashews, a humidifier, and a CPAP. Perfect. And that was plenty quick. So now you give a category to Eater. Eater. I want to hear about your three favorite type of types of trees. Oh, pine trees, uh, coconut trees, and uh, mm. that other kind of pine tree that's taller that's in California. What are those things called? Uh, and then either you give me three things. Three things that technology wouldn't improve. Sex lives, the taste of coffee, and my own handwriting. Try Imagine all of that, but two times Can as fast. Can our next podcast uh, as be entirely optimal. centered around how technology and would not improve sex lives? <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. All right, we have a topic. We got it. <laughs> No, I'll tell you, great moment. This Thanksgiving, I was home. I was playing some game with my mom and my brother. My mom asks, what are three things that you want for Christmas? She says that. And then I just blurt out like, uh, socks that don't have stripes on them, a piece of coal that's been aged for 2000 years and some brandy. And they look at me, they're like, what? I'm like, oh, you don't know this game, do you? Uh, And they ask what it is. And I introduce. And then for the next three hours or so, we're just playing three things. We're just going around in this circle, just asking random questions. You feel closer to people and you just feel more loose and spontaneous. And once you get into that nice rhythm. So that's game number one. The other game that I really like that's a scene game is New Choice. You ever you ever do this one? We did do this one. You've got two people up there. You know, they're, they're doing some kind of scene. So... Maybe one person comes on and he starts walking legs far apart and comes in with a big like cowboy accent. He's like, now, partner, this town just ain't big enough for the two of us. Something like that. And you say, new choice. And he has to say some different opening line. And if you don't like the other opening line that he gives, he's like, ah, those cattle have been here for a week. You say, new choice. And he just keeps coming up with new lines until you like it. The other person, you know, responds. And you don't just have to new choice them on the words that they say, but if the person walks on in some way, you say new new choice for how you walk. Very similar vibe to three things where you're just, you're making it so that they can't be planning ahead. They just have to come up with something on the spot that seems obvious. It's not like they're trying to make people uh, entertained. They're just trying to get you to stop saying new choice. It's just so unabashedly silly. The whole goal is to first evaporate any sense of judgment from your peers and from yourself looking inward. And once you've let that evaporate, it's just, it's like being naked. We all like it. We just, there's an initial discomfort, but once you get used to it, it's just, it's nice. All right. So someone asks, I brought up the mathematician's lament in the very first one that we did, uh, which was this paper by Paul Lockhart talking about how math should be treated as a creative art, but then it's got the fun hammered out of it. And he draws parallels. Imagine if you did this to music or to writing, what what it would look like. And he paints a pretty fun picture to that effect. And someone asks, 
what I would propose to fix the issues of math education that that addresses, which is obviously a crazy huge question, right? What, what do you do to fix people's impression of math? Um, Come on, Grant, how do you fix math education? Go. <laughs> Luckily, this is more targeted than that, right? right? Rather yeah. than saying, how do you fix math education? The specific problem being that people don't appreciate it as a creative art. How do you fix that? I think the only way is if you have a separate class, like an elective that is explicitly math as art. And the goal is to let people create things, whether that's creating a proof of something, creating uh, like an application of some new idea that they came to, you know, you show an elegant argument that shows some fundamental fact that you might've been asked to like prove in the class. And you just say, try to come up with other ways of viewing this. What other things can you draw? Is there a fundamentally different view that you can take here? Or you can have longer form projects. So it almost seems silly, but I think there's a lot of tools out there like Desmos where people can play around with it, get nice, pretty images from their grapher. But what's necessary to make those pretty images is to understand the underlying functions well enough to manipulate it the way that you want. And I think while that's not necessarily math in and of itself, it can be a nice little forcing function. Do you guys have any, any thoughts on that? Or should, uh, there's, there's a couple of so questions from the same person targeted at you that are on different topics. You want me to jump to those? Jump to eaters. I like, well, yeah, I like your answer to the last one. Eater, do you think that IT will become less accessible to people without university educations as more people with degrees enter IT? Or do you think that, can, that it can remain a field where one can enter it self-taught well into the future? I hope it remains a field where someone can enter it self-taught. And I, I frankly hope more fields become become more like that. I mean, I think regardless, it's going to be a field where you can continue to to be employed and progress in your career, you know, after you've after you've got some experience, like many fields, I think um, once you've made some professional contacts and and built up a bit of a portfolio of work that you've done and things like that, that um, you know, that is the the thing that you're really being evaluated on when you when you interview for a job is, you know, what have you done in the past? You know, what have you demonstrated your ability to do? And, and the the education is really only looked at kind of for that first job that you get. Hmm. That that would be my hope. You know, I think I think my fear is that if there are a lot of people that have degrees, particularly for that entry level job to kind of get your foothold in the industry, um, I I can see that being a discriminator that that people look at and say, well, you know, I have two candidates, they both seem reasonably qualified, you know, both of them are, you know, fairly early career. This one has a degree, this one doesn't. My, my hope is that, you know, my hope is that that isn't the case because it does seem like a lot of effort to put in for a fairly weak signal, in my opinion. I certainly agree with the hope on that front that more things become accessible to those that are self-taught rather than fewer things as, as the question seems to imply. Yeah. And the risk is as, as the industry matures, you know, there might be, I mean, similar to you know, uh, doctors and nursing and, you know, other, other sort of established careers that require a degree. I don't know. IT does feel different. I, I just don't, I don't see that happening. So the, the uh, final associated question, this one targeted at Stenhaug, uh, what's the state of research and education and what problems and questions are people working on in that research? That's an insanely large question. <laughs> yeah. like that is preposterous and i am in no place to comment but i will say so i think i mentioned this a couple times going into grad school i was either gonna do phd in statistics and then try to focus on education or do phd in education and then focus on quantitative um, things and what's turned out to be true about education which i think is really cool is you just have such a diversity of people answering such a diverse set of research questions from people looking at early child development to inequities in higher education to pedagogy to learning sciences neuroscience gets in there all of the time um, to mm -hmm. online learning and all of the research that goes around that so I, I think it's safe to say that nearly any question that you can think of providing either a qualitative or a quantitative uh, empirically based answer to related to education. Someone's at least thinking about something or doing some research adjacent to that. Um, I don't know. We could do an entire podcast about all sorts of the state of research and education. And let's, let's narrow it down. Like for you in particular, is there a key central question that's kind of on your mind that you would classify as an education research question? The key central question how do you manage a large item base slash determine item quality in these online environments? 
in particular because it's really hard when you don't know anything about a student and you presume both that they're learning and that the items are getting more difficult as they progress throughout the course. It's very, very challenging to disentangle those two things, increasing in ability and increasing in difficulty because they're always just a mesh together. And if you can't disentangle those two things, and you don't have a, a measurement of increasing abilities or learning, then it's really hard to get your finger on how effective particular items are. So that's that's kind of the crux of the research that... And an I item do. is a, a question that's trying to assess some particular skill. Yeah, it's yeah, it could be defined in different ways. Generally, on Khan Academy, it would be a question. So on Khan Academy, items make up exercises is the structure of that. Occasionally, it'll be a little bit of, of a larger experience. But in general, yeah, it's a question written to target a specific skill. Any, any questions on here that you, you want to hit next? I've got one for you, Grant. Shoot. Did you enter a maths competition when you were young? If so, yeah. how did it go? I feel like I was a little bit late on the on the game of like math competitions. Short answer, I wasn't bad, I wasn't great. I there was like a, a Utah State math competition that I typically did pretty well at, but that that's kind of a very localized thing. And but there's there's some ones that are a little more broad reaching. Like there's this thing called the AMC. And if you do well on that, there's the AIME. And basically I I like had passed the first round and then got very close to passing the second round, but didn't. The shortfall, ironically, was geometry, which I always felt weird about because I think of everything visually, but on problem-solving tests and competitions like that, geometry questions were just always the pitfall at that time. That was the conclusion there. But the thing is, I kind of just really enjoy them a lot. I think they're a beautiful bank of problems just to think about and also to help motivate students who might be, I don't know if they're maybe bored in math class or feel like they kind of like the subject, but they're not letting that love be expressed through the form of the homework being handed to them. I have mixed feelings about competitions because I don't like the insinuation of like winners and losers in the context of math. But certainly if you just take the questions and let people take as much time as they want on them and introspect about them, sort of meditate on why a certain solution worked rather than not working, rather than trying to plow through it and say, can you answer this in less than 60 seconds? The existence of some of these competitions, I think is just Honestly, it's one of the greatest things for math because it does a really good job of inspiring youth about what math really is because the people writing these questions are very often mathematicians and they, they're just echoing the sentiments that they feel and enjoy in their field of study into these little, little nuggets of cleverness. One on here that I actually do want to hit um, to shift to a different question. What is the most effective method in your eyes for independent learning? Uh, the question asker adds that he often feels himself frustrated with new materials being too shallow um, to really give helpful information or being way over his head. I have my own thoughts here, but I feel I like either is going to knock this out of the park. <laughs> For me, it's, it's, it's having a, having a question, um, some, some motivation of something I'm trying to solve, something I'm trying to do. So if I'm learning uh, a new programming language, let's say, then I need to have some project that I am invested in that I care about that I'm trying to do with that language. Inevitably, there will be some super tricky thing that I have to do, um, or at least it's tricky given that I don't know the language, that I have to do as part of this project that I want to do. And, and because of that, I, that forces me to then kind of peel, peel away the layers of the onion and to really dig in and, um, and kind of find my own way through the materials that are out there. And so for me, like the path that I take through the, whatever material is available is driven by you know, the goal that I have of, of producing something specific. And so in, in that sense, I don't find myself following a curriculum necessarily. I, I have found courses that do have a curriculum. And, and generally what I find there is, you know, I can go through it, I can do the material, and I feel like I'm learning a lot. And then typically at the end, I kind of don't feel like I've learned that much. Or maybe I, maybe I have, but at that point, then I need to like do my own project and, and kind of put myself in a position where I'm struggling to figure out um, how, to, how to do a thing that that again, that I'm kind of invested in wanting to make. I agree with that 100%. Having some kind of project that is the driver, a substantial difference. And the, the sentiment also of like going through a course and having that nicely laid out sequence of things that you're supposed to learn and you do the tasks and at the moment you feel like you learned them, but at the end feeling kind of empty. I think just about every student identifies with that at the end of their courses. And then also every adult who's done any kind of like MOOC or structured, you know, lifelong learning thing to that effect. I think, I think that 
That's pretty universal. One thing I'll add, because in the context of computer science, I feel like it's very clear how to have a project. Choose a thing you want to build and then try to build the thing. And in the context of people who want to learn math independently, if it's not math as an aid to an engineering project, but math as an abstraction, uh, as, as an art form, it can be harder to think of what the appropriate analog of a project would be. One thing that I found to be really helpful, if you're going to just say like a textbook, um, this isn't as good as having a project, but don't start by reading the start of the chapter and then going through it until you get to the end where there might be exercises. Flip back to the exercises and give them all really genuine tries. Maybe not all of them if there's a lot, it depends on the book, but spend some meaningful time with the exercises before having been exposed to any of the content. And some of them are going to rely on vocab that you just don't know yet, and that's fine. And you can kind of try, but odds are you should just skip that one. But a lot of them ask questions that the purpose of the question is that it's understandable before you know the material of that chapter, but becomes easier to solve because of that material. And this ends up being way better as a motivator for all of the theorems and topics in that chapter than the author typically does in trying to motivate it a little beforehand. Because you have in your mind, oh, wait, this would really help me solve that problem. Rather than, oh, in principle, that seems like a symmetric structure. That's what I would add for anybody pawing through. And actually, independent learning or learning in a school, I think that should also apply. If, if you've been assigned, read this chapter for homework, start with your problem set. Start with the questions at the end. And uh, don't go to the introduction and don't go to the theorems themselves until you have swimming around in your head a couple puzzles, right? A couple loose ends that need to be tied up. I'm curious, you guys seem spot on on that answer. How would your answer change in different subjects? Well, writing is a great one where you can have a project, right? Maybe it's in the context of trying to have a short story or even an anthology of short stories. Yeah. That feels like it would motivate. Um, and and that, that carries over to literature too, right? As, as you are reading other people's works, Eater's answer can be carried over almost word for word. With, with writing, it seems as if you would benefit more from having some sort of human feedback. I feel like that goes for not just writing, but everything, right? Maybe, maybe more so. Like, would you say this either for computer science, where having human feedback to tell you how you're doing, <laughs> what you could be doing better makes... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when when working with a team, you know, code reviews are, are key. Yeah, and, and doing them both ways, you know, having, having you know, senior engineers doing code reviews for, um, you know, folks who are earlier in their career. As well as vi as vice versa, you know, having having the early career folks looking and reading uh, code that was written by you know someone with twenty years experience, and trying to provide you know feedback, which which often they can, you know, if if even if you don't have much experience and you're reading someone who's got twenty years experience on you, you know, the questions that pop into your mind of like, wait, what is this? It's actually good feedback because that means like maybe the code isn't clear, mm. and, and so we we do that a lot, and it's I think that's really helpful you know, giving, giving feedback. Um, but you know, independent learning, maybe you don't have that option. It's sort of what I read into the presumption of the question is that for whatever reason, you're in a situation without, without a mentor or maybe without peers, I guess, find peers to help <laughs> do don't, don't learn independently is the answer. Learn independently with people. Let me, oh, okay. So a couple people asked, uh, whether I was, planning on doing more essence of type series. And I can only assume that those are people who maybe, I don't know, to some, I've certainly made clear, this is something I always want to have going on in the background and to make a big part of, uh, what three blue one Brown is about. Um, whereas the main channel's content is the standalone things trying to make you a little interested in one-off topics of math, starting to build out a library of places you can go. If you kind of want to prime your intuitions for a course, uh, short answer to this person's question. Absolutely. And if I, like a huge goal of mine is to ramp up on that in 2018. Um, three blue and brown will be expanding and a core goal of like the people coming on is to basically just output more of those. Hopefully, you know, you, you fast forward five years from now and there's a, there is a meaningful library of like essence of blank. So after probability, I'll probably do ones on maybe a sequel to linear algebra, and then maybe one on group theory, and then maybe one on some like high school topics are also in the mix, like algebra and geometry. Have yet to prioritize those perfectly, but that is the jumble of thoughts coming around. I want to see high that school. Very exciting. I want to see high school content. Here's the, yeah. Okay. So here's the thing on like high school content. Um, so do I, but that's where you suddenly enter the domain where there is so much of it out there, right? You want to talk about something that has been just 
covered to heck on the internet. High school algebra is, uh, there is no shortage of material online. And obviously the hope would be to have something that adds and is distinct from what others will find there. And, and also one of the, one of the people coming on, um, he currently is a high school teacher. And I think, um, his, I think his intuitions are actually going to be a lot better for putting together like algebra or geometry or trigonometry sequences. I want to hear Eater's response to the, to the one hour. If you could have a one hour interview with any significant historical figure, who would it be? And what would you talk about? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. That was kind of my response to the question. It was just, I don't have a clue, but I was excited. To there, okay. There's some say. questions. It's funny how when they're more broad, they're harder to answer. Me personally, I would be fascinated to chat with Ramanujan, who hmm. he's got a certain aura about him and his story because he came from like the classic stories that he claimed from the Indian slums, completely disconnected from the general at that time, like Western culture of mathematics and independently came upon certain discoveries that had not been discovered yet and wrote this letter to the mathematician Hardy who recognized his genius and brought him to England. And there's a, there's a bit more to the story than just that. They made a movie out of, out of it. It's called a man who, the man who knew infinity based on a book by the same title. What becomes apparent is he wasn't entirely disconnected from like the general world of math. He, he had at his disposal, like he, he took math classes and he also had this, this book that, uh, he learned a lot from. And the nature of that book is that it wasn't, it wasn't meant to teach. It was actually just a cram kit full of nothing but equations. Stop me if I've told you to this guys before, have I? I haven't heard this. Oh, oh, this is great. This is great. So you've got this, right? You've got this genius and everyone, everyone acknowledges the things this man came up with are just out of this world. Like, like he puts out this formula for computing pi where you can compute pi out to a whole bunch of digits really efficiently. And it's like the best formula known for computing pi, certainly at that time. They come there like, Ramanujan, like, where did you come up with things? How did you find this? Give us your proof. And he says, I had a vision from the gods, which is infuriating because <laughs> you want to know, like, <laughs> that's hard to repeat. But, okay. If you look, if you look this thing up, it's not just some formula. It's got like, it's got these just random constants in there. The thing starts as like the square root of eight divided by 99 squared. And somewhere like in the numerator of this term in the sum, it's like 26,390. It's not this beautiful little elegant, like Leibniz formula for pi or like the Basel problem computing pi. It just seems random. So what is going on in this man's mind is very different from what's going on in other mathematicians' minds. Um, so you'd wonder, what is this book that he learned from, right? What is this thing that produced this almost godlike genius that could just pluck beautiful formulas from, from the blue? And it was a cram kit. It was just a list of equations that was meant for Cambridge students to memorize before they went into their, their like main exams to like test the math that they had learned. But Ramanujan didn't view it as a cram kit because he wasn't in an environment where the goal was to be tested he viewed each one of those little equations like a personal challenge of here is a truth, C like come to an understanding within your own head for why this is true. And mm. I think this is, this is really interesting because it's almost like a recipe for genius. It's not guaranteed, but it starts to explain a little something. He was connected enough to the Western world for what is important because he had this book of the equations that were considered very important to mathematicians at that time but he wasn't so connected as to be exposed to the explanations that other people had. And he had to come to those explanations within his own head. And that as a slight balance of not being totally off on his own, but not being completely influenced by the status quo produced this uncanny originality. This is a good one. Besides freebooting on YouTube, what are the, what is the practice you think is most harmful to your channel or livelihood? Yeah, I read this and I was shocked at how I was not able to come up with a good answer, right? And I feel like I should have a good answer to that. What is what is most harmful to my livelihood? Patreon shenanigans? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the Patreon shenanigans. That that yeah, Patreon shenanigans might be most um threatening to livelihood. You familiar with this, Stenhaug? Oh um, boy. No. Drama this last week. <laughs> <laughs> so I got well, because because I'm the email address on our Patreon. 
I got an email about, hey, we're sorry. We're not going to go through with the fee changes. But it was a it was a quick right, read in let, the archive. Let me give you a rundown because I, I, I don't think you were like following the same people on Twitter that I do or seeing the just raw anger that some of this elicited. So we'll start at the start. Patreon gives a little announcement to creators. They say, hey, you know how you've been paying the processing fees, right? Like people pledge money. Uh, at the end of every month, we process all of those payments. 5% of it goes to Patreon, which I think is well worth it because they add like a lot of value. Um, but then a meaningful percentage, like uh, between 5 and 10%, it kind of depends on the sort of pledges that you're getting, go towards payment processors like PayPal or Stripe. So they say, a lot of people complain to us about, hey, I'm not getting paid at the end of the month the amount that I think I should because of these pretty wildly variable processing fees. So like what we're going to do is we're going to make patrons pay those. So if you pledge to someone, you know, $1 for their thing, you don't pay the $1, you pay $1 plus processing fees. Terrible idea. Um, and if it was just that, okay, maybe that's fine. Because one of the big value adds of Patreon is that rather than... If I just want to like support you, Stan Haug, and like send you money regularly, one of us is paying that transaction fee each time. But if you can bundle them all uh, so that uh, you have all of the payments happening at the same time at the start of a month from a bunch of people and it just gets paid out in one batch, that batching helps reduce the processing fees by a lot. Um, often like enough to make up for the 5% cut that Patreon takes. The processing fee isn't just a percentage of the amount paid. It's like a percentage plus 30 cents. Gotcha. There's a fixed exactly. and a marginal Exactly. Component. So that's key. So I'm thinking, okay, that's fine. It's a little awkward. They claim to have done the research with the conclusion that patrons are just happy to know that more of their money is going to the people they're supporting. And I say, whatever, same amount of fees. And I guess you're basically just telling people that they're pledging more than they thought they were. Slightly awkward. I don't like the idea of more friction towards people doing such a generous thing and potentially not showing the gratitude that they deserve. But then it seemed really weird because people started, you know, I see like on Twitter and everywhere else, hang on, hang on, hang on. Why suddenly is there this processing fee for each and every one of the pledges that I make where previously if I had 10 different $1 pledges, they were all batched so that the payment processing fee was for the $10 that I sent to Patreon. Now that fixed cost is spread across these uh, 10 different ones. Like, that doesn't make sense. I, like, why on earth should shifting who pays the fee shift the amount of fees or, like, eliminate the batching? Wait, shifting it increased no, the fee? it's that they conflated two different changes. At the same time that they shifted who is paying the processing fee, they also were like, we're going to switch the way that payments even happen so that instead of batching them on the month, the mo if it's a monthly person, like if I'm supporting you, Stenhaug, like per month for the thing that you're doing, the moment I pledged, I get charged immediately. And then every month after that, I get charged. So if it was on the 15th that I pledged, then it's on the 15th of every month that I get charged. If it was on the 10th, then it's the 10th of every month. And you as a creator are just getting this like continual, non-discrete flow of like money that's coming in, right? If it's a per gotcha. creation thing, like per video, for each creation, that is when the charge happens. So eliminating that batching. I kind of understand the reason they did that. It was like, I don't fault Patreon for thinking about doing that. There are a whole bunch of other creators for whom that would be a better model, uh, where things like exclusive content is a huge draw for people to be Patreons to certain pages. And you would have people who would pledge, let's say on the 15th, get access to the whole private catalog of content and then like remove their pledge before the start of the month when they would be charged for anything. This is where the awkward middle ground about Patreon being a way to offer people something like exclusive content versus being a platform for benevolent contributions. That awkwardness maybe started to come to come to a head by virtue of like conflating these two things and not really announcing that in the right way. You just had this whole pile of confusion. And most importantly, people who were like $1 patrons to a large number of people, let's say you're supporting like 15 people at $1 um, a month each, you saw the amount that you're paying jump by like 40%. Whether yeah. or not like these people are kind, that's just not a way, like whether they would say, oh, well, I'm happy that more money's going to the creator. You don't do that to someone. You don't say, hey, by the way, you're now like going to be charged 40% more than you thought you were before. Sorry, we didn't check in with you about that. No, that's and, bad. Yeah. And also like for me as, as someone who is a, a per like video type creator, it would have just, 
meant meaningfully more transaction fees on the whole because rather than things getting batched monthly, um, even if it is just like two to three videos a month, it's like that's it, you just have many more of those fixed costs. I know some people like lost patrons because of that. People who are like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing anything associated with Patreon, like ending my pledges to everyone. It wasn't actually a huge hit or I don't know, at least for me, it wasn't. I don't know if that goes for other creators, but it's a bunch. I mean, I, yeah, it's hard to, I wouldn't say it's huge, but there's, you know, it's a good page full of <sighs> yeah. people who dropped off and complained about not being happy with. Here's the cynical thing though. And things. Like, because you are no longer paying that processing fee and because the people who are leaving are like the the one dollar the, the the lowest ones did the math add up such that you are actually going to be taking in less i don't know i didn't yeah. didn't run the numbers so it was it wasn't clear cut uh it did make me start to think very seriously like in that moment i'm like well shit i like i'm going to do something different from patreon just to make sure that there is an alternate option for people, right? And just to make sure that there's not this hard dependency, you know, that is an aspect of Three Blue and Brown of like where people can, uh, if they want to either have like access to the early content or just be thankful or whatever it might be, maybe it's best not to let that lie under the monopolistic hood of a single entity. And um, so, wait, how does it end? So they make the change, everyone gets mad, <laughs> yeah, then, and then they, 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 then they come, they're like, back. whoa, 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 sorry, sorry, never mind, we're not going to do it, so sorry. Just kidding. Uh, just kidding. Uh, we'll do what we can to, like... Was that the best way so, to handle it at that point? At that point, probably. I mean, I don't know. Like there the, was a lot of outrage. The alternative is to, like, stick to their guns. So Jack Conte, the guy who runs Patreon, I actually like him a lot. I went to the, like, sort of, I don't know, conference-type thing that Patreon ran, and... Uh, I was able to chat with him just for a little bit. And I think he is extremely genuine about wanting to do what's best for the creators. And a lot of that just comes from his own background and just self-identifying as a creator. Either he's a phenomenal like salesman, like schmoozing me into that, but I, I think it comes from a very genuine place. You know, he had a couple, he had like a blog post uh, the day after they made this change to explain why they were. And I went from being like extremely confused to kind of understanding where they were coming from but still feeling like it was strictly worse for my page. Um, and the apology that he wrote about it was, it was good. It was sincere. And it does seem like you, you owe a lot to Patreon, right? They've, they've made what you're oh, doing yeah, pretty yeah. possible. Abs- like this is absolutely something that I feel. And I, um, you, you're, you're responding to my thought of switching platforms and doing something different. No, I guess I'm just responding with, uh, I, I, my sense is you just owe Patreon a great deal of gratitude and some slight mistake maybe knocks them down from being like absolutely the most amazing company ever in your book to a really solid company yeah, that you're still I, mean, I for. think it's sort of a wake um, up, right? I don't because, know I mean, what. That, that's sort of, we got here because of this question of what do you think is most harmful to your livelihood? And I don't know if harmful is the, the right word there, but it certainly the biggest impact on your livelihood is anything with Patreon, which is this thing you don't really have direct control over. Stenhaug, super glad you brought that up because my feeling is still one of genuine like love and gratitude towards Patreon and wanting things to work out for them. And I don't hold that much against them after this, but Peter, to what you said, like that is right. There's a, there's a lot of circumstances where you end up feeling a little bit dependent on single entities. Like a lot of us are dependent on Google. Luckily there's <laughs> enough different branches of that, that really you're dependent on a lot of different things, but they all just fly under the same corporation. That's always something to be cognizant of. I think the key there is that the incentives are aligned. That, yeah. Like with Patreon, I mean, they've, they've structured everything so that their incentives are wholly aligned with creators, which I like. Like, for example, a lot of sites, they want to do everything they can to keep their users on their site. Like YouTube wants you to stay at youtube.com no matter what. Patreon, they don't care if you're on patreon.com. So they're doing a lot of things to help you like integrate the pledge dynamics, whether that is where you contribute or where you can get access to certain things into other sites. Um, I think a lot of that is like sort of in their plans for what to roll out in 2018. And that's different, right? That is just very different from how other social media entities think and operate, but it makes sense for them because based on their like business model, what is good for creators is good for them. And the, the source of money and discovery of Patreon is not through patreon.com, but through the individual creator's websites or whatever their main entry point might be. Honestly, though, actually, what am I, what is, 
I know we've been on this for a while, but what, what's a practice that's most harmful to the channel or livelihood? Anything that's harmful to the economy at large. Let, let's just look at Patreon contributions. People's willingness to like keep the channel going or show gratitude in the form of like having some of their hard-earned money, it's a little bit like allocated towards a piece of free content that they consume. If you have any kind of economic downturn, that's like the first thing to go. Yeah, it's like a non non tax deductible philanthropic donation. Right. Yeah. It's just it's crazy and it's lovely, but it's worth knowing. Like, if there were some sort of dot com type boom or two thousand two thousand eight type crash, I think that would just have a very meaningful impact on um, people whose businesses and livelihoods have any any substantial portion of revenue coming from Patreon. <laughs> In that way, like Wall Street shenanigans might be actually the the most harmful most harmful thing to to my own livelihood game clock game clock that's it that's a wrap